Carroll created the absurd world of Alice in Wonderland. He also wrote another story that was about an equally odd little place that created a perfect map. The map was so perfect that the scale of it was one to one. And so it shut out all the sunlight because it covered the entire town. Eventually, the townspeople decided that they didn't like this map very much and that they would use the town itself as a map instead. Maps are a type of model. We use them to try and understand more complicated things. And the town's map is an example of a model that isn't very good. The awkwardness of unfolding it aside, this map is pretty useless because it's just as complicated as the area it models and it's no easier to understand. Lewis Carroll was a mathematician and he understood that the fine detail is not so helpful when we talk about modeling. A good model is a simplification of reality and it omits detail so that we can focus on what's relevant and start to explore, understand, and predict the system that we're looking at. When it comes to climate, models are a really important tool because we only have one Earth and one climate, so we can't do many real experiments with it. But with a model, we can start to answer questions like, what would happen if all the clouds disappeared? Or if we doubled our concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Actually, that second one is not the best example because we're well on our way to doing that experiment in real life. Today, I want to demystify the process of mathematical modeling and show you how we can wrap our heads around key climate change terms like resilience, stability, and tipping points. To do this, we're going to build a model from the ground up our model is based on conservation of energy on some hypothetical planet. And there are two key ingredients for our model that we're going to look at. Absorbed energy from the incoming solar radiation and the emitted energy that's radiated back to space. How much of the incoming energy is actually absorbed depends on what it hits. So let's consider the extreme cases. If our hypothetical planet was very cold, we'd expect it to be covered in lots of ice and snow, which would reflect well, keeping the absorbed energy low. I'll call this the snowball state. If, on the other hand, our temperature of our planet was quite high, then there'd be lots of land and deep dark ocean, which would absorb well. I'll call this the flame ball. Now, with this thought experiment, we've already illustrated one of the key ingredients of climate change, feedback. The reflection that happens when there's lots of ice and snow reinforces and amplifies the snowball state, keeping it cold. That is, the temperature determines the energy absorption, which in turn determines the temperature. How the absorbed energy changes between these two extremes depends on the underlying physics and looks like so. The key here is that it's not the incoming solar radiation that's changing, but how much of it is actually absorbed at different temperatures. The emitted energy can also be described well by the underlying physics. A warmer planet would emit radiation better than a cooler planet. And so the emitted energy curve looks like this. They're both just energies so I'm going to put them both on the same plot so that we can properly compare the incoming and the outgoing energy. Now, when our curves intersect, the absorbed energy and the emitted energy are equal, and the state is in an equilibrium. This happens at three different temperatures in our system, and each of these temperatures would produce a very different looking climate. The first is nice, temperate climate and it would support human life. It has ice caps, but it's not a complete snowball. So I'll call this Earth-like. The second is a much warmer version. Think uh, lava flowing, bushfires running rampant, and I'll call this the hot house. And the third is something in between. 
Now, these states are three different versions of the same hypothetical planet, but only one of them will exist at any given time. So, let's assume that right now it's the Earth-like planet state that currently exists. We'd like to understand the stability of this climate. And so to start looking at that, we explore what would happen when the temperature changes slightly and how it would respond. Decreasing the temperature a little bit, the absorbed energy would be greater than the emitted energy because the red line is above the blue line. This means more energy would be coming into the system and so the temperature would increase. If, on the other hand, we increase the temperature slightly. Now the emitted energy is greater than the absorbed energy, which would drive the temperature lower. For this reason, the Earth-like state is currently in a stable state, because when we give it a nudge, it will be pulled back to where it was before. Like a ball in a valley, when it's pushed, it comes back. And for this reason, it's also called an attractor. If it were the hothouse version of the planet that currently existed, well, that's also a stable attracting state that's in a valley. Both of these states have resilience because it would take quite a substantial change in temperature for their climate to, to really shift. In between two valleys, there must be a hill and a ball on top of the hill would be unstable because any small change to it would cause it to roll down the hill. In our case, this planet's climate, if the temperature changed ever so slightly, it would be forced into one of the alternate climates. We can summarise all this information on a single line. This line shows the different versions of the planet and their stabilities. Let's now assume that there's an alien species that lives on our Earth-like planet. And this species is able to somehow change the emitted energy from their planet by, say, changing the greenhouse gas concentration. If they increase the greenhouse gas concentration, well, then more of the radiated energy would be trapped in the atmosphere and the greenhouse gas effect would get worse. With less energy being emitted, our emitted energy curve, the blue curve, will shift down. The intersections it makes with the red curve will change, and the Earth-like state will move to the right, increasing its temperature. If the aliens continue to increase greenhouse gas concentration, well, less energy will be emitted. So the blue curve will move down, the intersections will change, the Earth-like planet will move to the right, increasing its temperature even more. And if they continue to do this, right up until the Earth-like state collides and overlaps with the unstable state, well, now their climate is half-stable like a valley on one side and a hill on the other. If the temperature is decreased, that's fine. It will come back to where it was before. But if the temperature is increased, this planet's climate will run away to the hothouse. And this, this is the key because this is a tipping point. Any further increase in greenhouse gas concentration will cause the Earth-like state to be destroyed. And only the hothouse will remain. Because at this level of emissions, that top summary curve that we see, there's only one version of the planet. And it's much, much warmer. OK, so the aliens recognize their mistake. They quickly uh, draw down carbon from the atmosphere and reduce their greenhouse gas emissions more energy can now be emitted. So the blue curve will move back up. The temperature of their planet will cool a little. But the Earth-like state, just because it exists now, doesn't mean that they get to occupy it. They're stuck in the hothouse. 
Because remember, the hothouse is stable and resilient. So if they want to move out of it, it's going to take a lot of effort. They're going to have to reduce their greenhouse gas concentration down beyond even where it was when they first started putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere until they reach another tipping point. And only then will they be able to cross back into the ice cap detractor. This is called hysteresis. It means that crossing these tipping points is irreversible. A tipping point is the straw that broke the camel's back. It's a large scale, drastic change in a system that can't be unwound just by removing one straw. In our Earth's climate system, tipping points such as the Amazon rainforest dieback, permafrost loss, and Greenland ice sheet disintegration can all be thought of in a similar manner to our model. There's a good state to be in and a bad state to be in. And the transition from one state to another may take place over decades or even centuries, but once that collapse has started, it may be virtually impossible to stop. The climate is complicated and a lot more complicated than just absorption and emission of energy. But by reducing it to just these two factors, we've been able to derive genuine insight into one of the climate's main driving factors. It's the simplicity of this model that let us do that. And we know that simple models like this are good because they've worked really well in the past. In fact, a model quite similar to this was actually used to understand the carbon dioxide's role in our own planet's atmosphere and temperature. Climate models have come a long way from the simple energy balance models that we've seen today. But state-of-the-art modeling still can't produce a one-to-one -one map of the climate. And that's OK, because that true future, the one-to-one -one map, is not so helpful to us. What's far more valuable are the alternate futures that modeling can show us by considering various socioeconomic responses and possible outcomes of our actions. This isn't just theoretical. Right now, climate scientists are modeling an entire array of possible pathways to help us find the best possible route to limiting global warming to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. The good news is that the most recent IPCC report and the models that they refer to show us that avoiding catastrophic tipping points is still possible. There's still time. But critically, we can only do it if we stay on the pathways that these models, our maps, are giving us. They won't be perfect, of course, but unlike the town in the Lewis Carroll story, these maps are really good. Thank you.